Today, we hear passages about the Holy Spirit. Our first passage is from the book of Job. God's Spirit made me. The Almighty's breath enlivens me. And in Acts 2, we read, In the last days, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. And in the Gospel of John, we read, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion, companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. And from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in faith so that you overthrow, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You may be. In 2015, I ran Grandma's Half Marathon in Duluth. This was my third and final half marathon. <laughs> I'd been running for about eight or nine years at that point, and while I loved the benefits of running, I loved the community that gathered around these running events, I never really liked running. <laughs> and running a marathon was never, ever on my bucket list because I never got to the end of a half marathon and said, wow, I could do that all over again right now. <laughs> but I've always been in awe of those folks who run marathons. I'm just curious, curious. David, I know I asked you this morning, you've run 61 marathons. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else run one? Hey, Marv, all right. Anyone else? No. So I'm, I'm in awe of the folks that have that discipline and that training and that time to do so. I'm also in awe and just really curious and mesmerized by these ultra competitions, these triathlons. Did you know we have an Ironman as a part of our Messiah Church family? Benji Spence attends second service with his wife and two daughters, but he's been competing in triathlons since 2007 as the result of a simple New Year's resolution that he was going to break the chain of unhealthy living in his family and so that year, he did his first triathlon, and he just fell in love with the discipline and the training that was required to compete. So he made himself a promise, and he said he would compete in at least one triathlon every year until he turned 50. Well, so far he's on track, having completed 15 triathlons. This fall, he's going to complete, compete in Ironman Florida. Let me tell you a little bit about these Ironman competitions. They begin, this one will, with a two and a half mile swim in the Gulf of Mexico. That is when the strong currents, the riptides, the possible marine life encounters along the way. And then they hop on their bikes and they ride 112 miles on flat, fast bike track. And then, to wrap it all up, they run a full marathon, 26.2 miles now, the bikes that they use in these competitions are not, no regular bike. They are aerodynamic. They are top-of-the-line technology. They can cost up to $17,000. Benji says his bike costs nowhere near that much. And you think you pay that much for something, it would come with a motor, right? <laughs> they do not. But these are the best bikes you can get if you want to go fast. But if anything, anything at all is not working right on these bikes, 
It can be as simple as a $50 chain or a $10 cable. That bike is going nowhere. Here's Benji with a little closer look at this bike. So this is a bike specific to triathlon. Okay. It's, uh, it's set up for speed and aerodynamics. So uh, for instance, these handlebars are aero bars so that you can lean over and be in a more streamlined position. It's uh, made of carbon fiber, which is a very lightweight and strong material, which also allows it to be very, as you can see from this side, very thin, if you will. You can almost like not see it, <laughs> it kind of disappears. Right. And then same thing with the wheels. So the wheels can be very, um, you know, they're, they're very aerodynamic, also made of carbon fiber, um, really made for speed. And um, so you don't have to work so hard uh, for the entire race. Uh, and then to your point, the, you know, the piece that can really ruin your day that is very inexpensive is this cable right here. So this is like a, this is just a brake cable. You know, pretty cheap. If you don't have the brakes, you can't stop. So while these bikes are made to go fast with a lot of power, if they're not making the right connections, you're out of the race. So that reminded me as I was preparing this message today, it seems like a lot like our spiritual lives. You know, God gives us this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit that wants to live in and through us. But if we lose that connection, we will live a spirit less life instead of a spirit-filled life. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to spend some time. We're going to look at scripture to see who the Holy Spirit is. We're going to look at the fruits of the Spirit and why we as followers of Jesus are called to live in the Spirit. You know, as Christians, we are taught to think about God in terms of the Trinity. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think the concept of God the Father is something that we can wrap our minds around. The Father, the creator of all living things. And then Jesus Christ, his son, who came to us in human form and died to redeem us from our sins. I think those are concepts that we kind of get. But I think where we struggle is with this idea of the Holy Spirit and what it means in our lives. If that's where you are, don't worry. You're in good company. You know, theologians from across time have struggled with how to communicate this idea so that our little tiny human brains can understand it. The Reverend Francis Chan wrote a book called The Forgotten God in which he talks about the Trinity and how we do struggle with knowing who the Holy Spirit is. So the goal for this series and why I think it's really important for us to understand the Holy Spirit is this. The key to experiencing God's presence and peace and power in our lives is the Holy Spirit. So we're going to take time and we're going to dig into that over the next three weeks. So let's start today with scripture. Scripture is always a great place to start. The Holy Spirit is mentioned over 800 times throughout scripture. And the very first mention of it is in the second passage, the second sentence of the first book. This is Genesis 1, chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I think sometimes we think in terms of the Holy Spirit coming to us at Pentecost, like we celebrated a couple of weeks ago. But we can see here by this this passage here that the Spirit was present at the beginning of time and throughout all of creation. So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish people's sacred text, the word for spirit is ruach. Ruach is a word that has actually several meanings. It can also mean wind or it can mean breath. So when you're reading through the Old Testament scripture, the word ruach can mean God's spirit, it can mean a human spirit, it can mean an evil spirit, or it could mean wind or breath. But over a hundred times in the Old Testament alone, 
It's referring to the Spirit of God. And as we read on in the book of Genesis, we read that God breathed breath into the first human to give life. So while we are formed in our mother's wombs, it is God's breath, God's ruach, the Spirit of God that gives us life. Listen to what Job says. God's spirit made me. The Almighty's breath enlivens me. It's that spirit that animates us and empowers us and gives us life. You know, in the Old Testament, we see that the spirit came at specific times to specific people for specific reasons. We read that the spirit descended and then would depart. We see it with King Saul when the Spirit of God descended on King Saul. We see it in the story of David after that horrible incident with Bathsheba where David says, God, don't take your spirit away from me. We see it when God sends his spirit to, spirit to warriors of Israel so that they could win battles that they could never have won on their own. And we see it when God sends spirit to the prophets so that they can speak on God's behalf. But all of that was about to change. Listen to what the prophet Joel says as he prophesied about the future. After that, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. So this is a new picture of the Holy Spirit coming for everyone that's made possible through the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we see that spirit that comes to Jesus on his baptism. We see that spirit who leads Jesus into the wilderness. We see that spirit anoint Jesus to preach good news. And the Apostle Paul, he tells us that's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave. On that night before he was crucified, Jesus gathered his friends around that table in the upper room to share a holy meal like we are going to remember and celebrate here a little bit later today. And as he was sitting there with them, he said to them, the same spirit that is on me is going to come to you. You know how the story unfolds from here. Jesus is crucified, dies, and was buried. On the third day, he rose from the grave. And before he ascended into heaven, he spent a little bit more time here on earth with his disciples, and he told them to go to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit would meet them there. And they did. And that's exactly what happened on that first Pentecost. That Spirit of God came down, and they were walking the streets and speaking in languages that they had not understood or could speak before so that everyone who had come to Jerusalem for the festival could hear the story of Jesus. The Holy Spirit gave them the ability to do supernatural things in a natural world, and that Spirit is in you, too. So maybe you're thinking, well, wouldn't it have just been better if Jesus never left in the first place? I mean, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have had to come, right? And in some regards, you might be right, I mean, if you are sick or injured, you could just say to Jesus, will you heal me? And you'd be healed. Or, say you're eating lunch, you got a Subway sandwich and a bag of chips, and you notice folks around you have nothing to eat. You could say, hey Jesus, can you help us here? And poof, everybody would have plenty to eat. So, in some regards, that could be great, but because Jesus was fully divine and fully human... He lived within the constraints of a human body, and he could not be everywhere at once. So he tells his followers, it is actually better for you if I go and send the Holy Spirit to you, because if I don't go away, the companion won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, God wants to live in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit, but rather than living a spirit-led life, I think too often we lose that connection or maybe never make that connection to begin with, and we end up leading spirit-less lives. And I think there's maybe three reasons, main reasons, that this could happen. The first one is sometimes 
We're not even aware that there is a Holy Spirit. You know, we said understanding God the Father and Jesus the Son, we kind of get that, but this Holy Spirit is kind of nebulous and fuzzy and hard to grasp. And you know, Christians in the first century felt the same way too. They didn't get it either. And we can read about it in, cha in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. Now, these aren't the original 12 disciples. These are some new believers in Jesus. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So obviously these folks weren't present at Pentecost, but they knew and they were worshiping the one true and living God. They believed and were following Jesus, but they did not quite grasp the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's where you are today too. You know, Thanksgiving of 2021, after those long, what, year and a half of not being able to travel, uh, Jerry and I and our kids and their kids decided we'd make a trip to San Diego to spend Thanksgiving with my mom. We hadn't seen her in almost two years. And our youngest daughter, Emily, and her then fiance, now husband, Mike, were traveling with Jerry and I as we went to the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport. And if you've ever been to that airport on a holiday week, you know it can look a lot like this. The crowds are enormous, and they're loud, and they can be smelly, and there's pushing, and there's shoving, but you just kind of gear up for it, right? Because that's what you signed up for. So Jerry and Emily and Mike and I, we made it through that security line, and Jerry and I were heading off to the gate, and Mike and Em were heading off in a different direction. And so where are you going? They said, we are going to the Delta Sky Lounge. The Delta Sky Lounge, doesn't that just sound lovely? Mike's dad is a pilot for Delta, and so Mike has privileges in the Delta Sky Lounge. It looks like this. <sighs> it's quiet. There's room to spread out. There's clean bathrooms with no waiting. There's free food. And you know, Jerry and I weren't even aware there was a place like this. Everybody outside that area was not aware that there was a place like this, and it was right there. And I think that's how the Holy Spirit is sometimes. It's right there, but we don't see it. I think the second reason that perhaps we live a spirit, we live without the Holy Spirit in our life is because we resist the Holy Spirit. You know, in the past few months, we've talked about how God has given us free will, free will to choose to accept or to ignore that still small voice that we hear, that little tap on our shoulder or that feeling of a nudge to head off in a certain direction. But sometimes we ignore that spirit, and when we do, it can look a lot like this. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to get anywhere. And eventually, if you ignore the Holy Spirit long enough, the time will come when you can't even recognize the voice of the Spirit in your life at all. Yep, she just gave up. <laughs> you know, the, Stephen, before he was stoned, told the religious leaders this, you stubborn people, in your thoughts and your hearing, you are like those who have had no part in God's covenant. You continuously set yourself against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors. You might be thinking, well, I don't know if I've ever felt that nudge or heard that small voice, but the Spirit is within you, and the more you walk in your faith and grow deeper and closer to Jesus Christ, the more you become aware of it. But the, the secret here is knowing the difference between your voice and the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the way you can usually recognize that is because our voices are usually focused on us. What's best for me? What's most comfortable for me? What's in it for me? But the voice of the Holy Spirit encourages us to focus on other people and to ask, how can I make life better for someone else? The more we walk with Christ, the more we feel those promptings and denying them or going in the opposite direction like that lady trying to get up the down escalator, 
the more our hearts become hardened and it's difficult to hear that voice. Then I think maybe there's a third reason that we leave a spirit, lead a spiritless life, and that's because of sin. You know, when we allow anger and greed and jealousy to enter our lives, it starts to take over and consume us and leaves no room for the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, those sins can become addictions. Addictions to alcohol, to gambling, to gossiping, to pornography. Maybe it's an, uh, an addiction to accumulating more and more material wealth. Maybe it's that rage or that envy or that anger that is just pushing the Holy Spirit away from you. God's given us this amazing gift to empower and to shape and to guide us. And all we got to do is accept it. So how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Well, I think to understand that, it's going to help if we look at the words that Jesus said to his disciples that night at the Last Supper. The first thing he says is, I'm going ahead of you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says this, I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. Now, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, and John, the writer of this gospel, wrote in Greek. And so the Greek word that John uses, that Jesus used for Holy Spirit, is paraclete. Now, paraclete is actually a compound, two Greek words coming together. Para means to come alongside, and kletos means called to. So the Holy Spirit is called to come alongside us. It's also a word that's used to refer to a helper or a counselor or a companion. And so when we understand the full meaning of this word, I think it helps us to understand how the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. I think first the way the Holy Spirit ministers to us in our lives is by comforting us. You know, you might be in a season of life right now that's really hard. Or maybe you remember being in a season of life that's really hard. But you have these circumstances that seem overwhelming, maybe even unsurmountable. But somehow, deep inside of you, there's this little sense of peace that everything's going to be okay. What is that? I think that's the peace of God that passes all of our human understandings. That's the comfort that the Holy Spirit brings to us. I think another way that the Holy Spirit ministers to us in our lives is by counseling us, giving us wisdom and discernment and pointing us in the right direction. Here's what Jesus said about that. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truths. He won't speak on his own, but will say whatever he hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit will guide and counsel and lead us in the right direction. And the third way that the Holy Spirit ministers to us is by convicting us. You know, I love these words from the prophet Isaiah that said, whether you turn to your right or to your left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. It's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Is there something in your life that is causing you to step in the wrong direction? Something you need to get rid of? Something you need to walk away from? Or that's making you a slave to sin? See it. Acknowledge it. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you to recognize it and to walk away. Or perhaps you're here today in the room or online and you're not a follower of Jesus. And yet, something's drawn you here today. I think that's the Holy Spirit convicting you to maybe know more about Scripture, to hear more of the stories of Jesus and what it means to live a life following Jesus. So if you feel that Spirit nudging you today, I want to encourage you to pay attention. That's the Spirit inviting you to lead a Spirit-filled life. 
Well, I'm going to close today with these words that Paul gives us in his letter to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and faith so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you read that with me? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and faith so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And who doesn't want joy and hope and peace overflowing in their lives? So if you're here today and you're feeling hopeless or afraid, if you're feeling lost or burdened, then tap into the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you. You want to know how to do it? It's pretty simple, actually. You just have to ask. So today I want to close with this prayer. I want to invite you to repeat it after me as we invite the Holy Spirit to come. Can you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Help me to understand the way to go. Help make me more like Jesus. May I never lose the connection with the Holy Spirit. So I can experience the joy of walking with you. And feeling your presence with me every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.